My name is Simone Wright, and I currently serve as the 2013-2014 Student Government Association President. First, I want to welcome you all to this town hall meeting and also thank you all for being here and coming out and voicing your opinions. We also want to thank our administrators for taking the time out of their schedule to be here as well. So first we're going to ask our AWS president, Ms. Megan Henderson, to lead us in prayer and then we're going to introduce our administrators. Good evening. Good evening. Everyone bow your heads, please. Dear God, we thank you for this University of Southern. God, we thank you for our family. God, we thank you for the legacy and traditions of this institution. God, we ask for blessings for our university, our administrators, our students, and we ask that you continue to help us grow and thrive. God, give us the knowledge and power and always to help us keep Southern University great. In the Lord's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Now I'm going to introduce our administrators. First, we have President of the Southern University System, Dr. Ronald Mason. Woo. We have Chancellor of the Southern University at Baton Rouge School, excuse me, Dr. James Lorenz. This is in a specific order. We have Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Dr. Ella Kelly. The Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Dr. Virginia's Peoples. The Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Dr. Brandon Dumas. Mr. Eli Guillory, Director of Facility Services. Ms. Tracy Abraham, Director of Housing. Mr. Kevin Jack Johnson, Deputy Administrator. Chief Jocelyn Johnson, the Interim Chief of Police. Dr. William Broussard, Athletic Director. Mr. Marcus Coleman, Dean of Students. Mr. Raymond Clark, Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Success. And Ms. Deloise Brown, Director of Food Services. Now we're going to have I, I, now we're going to have words from our student leaders. Our AWS president is here. I believe our sophomore class president is here as well. And there, and Miss Southern, of course, is here. They're going to come up and tell you some of their plans for the upcoming semester. Henderson, a senior apparel merchandising and textile major from the splendid city of Shreveport, Louisiana, and I currently serve as the Association for Women Students President here at the Great Southern University. All right, for the spring semester, the Association for Women Students will be hosting several powerful programs in which we'd love your participation. Our week is scheduled for February 16th through the 21st, where we will continue to uplift the women of Southern University through powerful programs that are exciting and new while we hold true to our roots. We seek to spend time with the students during this time with regular meetings, and we also want to host meetings in the dorms to get the concerns of the students on campus as well. I am so grateful for you all for all the love you've shown thus far, and I'm very happy to stand here and serve the women of Southern University. Thank you. Ms. Ayanna Spivey, you're Miss Southern University. Good evening again. I am Ayanna Spivey and I serve as the 83rd Miss Southern University. First, I would like to thank everyone for their support in helping out my new organization, Community Outreach Programs, as also known as COPS. I know it was a hard transition moving with this change, um, but we were able to raise last semester over $4,000, continuing to support St. Jude's Children's Hospital, as well as the new initiatives of the BR Sickle Cell and Kidney Foundation. We will be, conti we will be continuing to raise funds this semester for COPS. Um, February 13th, we will be having a Sweetheart Cocktail along with SGA and the Beta Sigma Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha in the Cotillion Ballroom. 
Um, and I'm also working on my last platform, which is the Miss Teen SU pageant on March the 21st, which will be featuring high school campus queens in the neighboring areas. Lastly, I will be traveling to California along with Madam President to work with the Los Angeles Southern Alumni Chapter to help bring Southern to young high school students and hopefully bring future Jacks to the bluff. I look forward for you all's support and look forward to more events such as a date auction as well as the chaos party along with the SU NPHC. Thank you again for your continuous support. Okay, and I also have some things that you all can look forward to from student government as a whole. We have um, we are teaming with the Student Affairs to bring some lecture speakers to the university to talk about success and building your brand and how they reach and achieve their goals. We are also partnering with Career Services to launch the MyEDU.com website. It's a website where you build a profile profile similar to a Facebook profile. But instead of friends coming to see your profile, it's actually employers. They come and look at you and they can offer you jobs on there or do um, Skype interviews and things like that via that website. We will be having a voters informational about running for office and what it entails to be a SGA official. Uh, we're having a program called Dear Sally May, and we have a man who will come out and talk to you about taking out loans and what it means and not to be afraid to take out loans and the best options of paying your loans back. And last but not least, of course, we're going to have the Spring Fest activities. Next, I want to bring up my Vice President, Ms. Sarah Martin, and she will tell you about what's coming up with the Senate. Good evening. Um, a few things that the Senate will be working on this spring semester. Um, the first of which should be the Student Government Association Legal Reformation. And all it is is the Constitution, the bylaws, and the election code are going to be reformed so that student government can work more efficiently. Uh, we found over the years with some of us and our, our experience in SGA and the things that we experienced when we uh, learned the basics about student government um, that we can do a lot better with managing um, student and student leadership if we could get our laws a little bit more up to date and a little bit more understandable. And so we'll be working on that. The other most important thing that probably concerns students the most is the committees that we have um, that are specific to different initiatives on campus. Campus beautification being one, campus safety, child care, and a few others that we have a committee for in the Senate specifically so that we can take care of the needs that students are concerned about. We started talking to some of the leaders that are sitting up here on this table so that we can um, start collaborating with students about what those things are and writing legislation to exact the changes that students need to see during the upcoming semester and for the future of Jaguar Nation. And those are just some of the things that we're aiming for um, with the Senate. Thank you. portion. If you at any time you have a question that you would like to answer, you can just raise your hand and Myron will bring you a card and a pen. So if you have a question, anybody have a question you need to write down? No? Okay. First we're going to um, ask our Chancellor to start with his questions that he's been given and begin to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Bray. I've just been going through uh, some of these, and I think it's it's probably there are a lot of questions that would go to a number of the uh, number of the administrators that are here. But what I'd like to do is is go through it at about ten or twelve. So I don't know how long y'all want to be here um, tonight. Some of them are 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 closely related, others are not. I'm not taking them in any particular order priority. And then what we'll do is is I think maybe in some cases have some of the administrators respond to those questions. Um, first one is, why does it seem as if the staff isn't knowledgeable about their positions? Uh, in parentheses, perhaps, perhaps there should be more job training about their positions uh, to improve efficiency. Uh, we agree with that, in fact, and, and I may be taken away from, from President Mason uh, what would be a response to this too, but as you know, human resources 
uh, is now a, a, a system-wide function. The Human Resources Department has just, uh, in the past several months, hired a training, uh, is a director, Mr. Mason, is a training director, Ms. Benjamin, uh, and her responsibility is to go out and, and not go, but she is in the process of developing a training program for all uh, administrative personnel within uh, not only this campus but all the all the campuses within the system. And one of the things that we're talking about is the need for cross training, the need for our individuals to know uh, other persons' positions, responsibilities, and duties. As you know, we've we've gone through a period over the past four years of, of budget cuts has resulted in a reduction of staff. We've had, uh, we've had retirements, we've had retirement incentives for staff and faculty members. Uh, we're now at the point where we have to start filling those positions again. So we know that customer service is an issue there for a number of reasons. In some cases we lose uh, because of somebody opting to take the retirement incentive a key position. If we're able to start realizing an increase in funding, we're able to, to, to start filling some of these vacant positions that are out there because of a lack of funding. But the HR department has developed a plan. They have uh, hired a director of training, and that person is tasked with the responsibility of going through it. And, and she's come to us. She's met with the various campus chancellors. She attends, she attends my staff meetings on a regular basis, so she represents the system HR responsibilities at my, at my staff meetings, campus staff meetings, and we're able to share with her what our priorities are. So we understand that we're moving in that direction and it, it becomes training. I've also directed my uh, Vice Chancellor for Finance Administration to think all of our staff members now have been directed to start um, receiving ID cards and we're mandating that every staff member have an ID card uh, open, visible, uh, when dealing with the students. So as you go in, you meet with the, with the various personnel, you should know who you're talking to should be able to identify them so that when you have issues and you have concerns, it's not just saying someone, but know who that is, know who that person is, and, and share that information with us. We can, only, we can only act on the feedback that we receive from you, and if that feedback has to be as specific as possible so that we can address those issues. Okay. Any other? <laughs> okay. Uh, why is there poor interdepartmental communications? Uh, like calling the cashier's office and they literally tell, tell me that's not our department with underlined zero insight. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that again relates to, uh, to what we're talking about in terms, of, in terms of training. I think a lot of these are related. I'll kind of go through them and think we, you know, rather than try to repeat the answers again. This one is addressed to uh, myself and Dr. Dumas. Again, poor customer service when I call Southern. If someone answers the phone, 90% uh, of the time the staff is uncooperative, uh, not very helpful. Okay, those those three, and you know it's something we fought at Southern for, you know, for a long time. It's it's something we try to address. I think some departments are very, are much more proactive in terms of addressing those issues and try to be more helpful. Uh, a lot of other instances, we just you know we just have individuals that. We have to weed out if necessary, but also have to train them into the proper uh, customer service. I was just sharing with uh, President Mason um, at the sad uh, responsibility and, and, and obligation on this Saturday to attend funeral services for one of our uh, registrar personnel, Mr. Cecil Houston. And one of the things that, that we kept getting back in terms of Facebook posts and everything was was Mr. Houston's responsiveness to students and the fact that, that he was one of the people that, that you could count on to help uh, when you went into the registrar's office. And it sort of struck a card with me uh, that you know here's someone that we've lost that was so important and so, so valuable to us that could lend a lesson uh, to other individuals in the, in the campus. So I just shared with, with President Mason, I have a, he's the only person I've shared with so far, but we're going to do it, uh, but we're going to uh, to, to drive this customer service thing, we're going to institute a um, Cecil Houston customer service award. Um, you know, and it'll be a cash award, significant cash award uh, for individuals, so that that we have to provide an incentive to our to our staff people uh, to provide that customer service. Uh, we're going to do that. We'll, we'll make that award at the end of this semester. 
uh, so that, that we'll get something out quickly so that it'll start. So, so you know, so that staff members will know that, that we're serious, we, you know, we're concerned about it, and here's an opportunity for you to demonstrate good customer service and be recognized for that at the end of the semester. So we're, we're trying to do everything we can to increase that. We realize that a number of our, our staff members are working in a situation where in the past several years they've had absolutely zero pay rates and in many cases furloughs where they've lost a lot of money. Uh, but we still have to, uh, we have to move forward with, with solid customer service. Um, next question is why after two years are my out-of-state fees not waived? Said. Most schools consider you a resident after two years of attending the school. Uh, you know those. You know the out-of-state fee policies are established uh, by the board. I think in accordance with Board of Regents guidelines in terms of what we have to do and what Louisiana does in terms of recognizing out-of-state fees. Every state is different. Uh, I know there are some states that let you stay one year and all of a sudden you are you are are free from out-of-state fee waivers if you establish a residence. Unfortunately, we're tied into uh, into those and so once you come in the only way that you can gain resident status is to actually be out of school for one full year without having earned and someone correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong in this but not having earned more than six hours in the 12 month period and established a residence and employment within the state of Louisiana and it's only after that point that you can come in and apply for residency and, and have your out-of-state fees waived. Um, so we're, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's something that we, that we sort of tied to by the regulations. Uh, you, know, you know, maybe it's something, Mr. President, we can look at in terms of, of any adjustments that can be made and, and whether it takes going to the, uh, you know, to the legislature or to the Board of Regents. But the legislature's taken a very hard stance on out-of-state fees. Um, in the past, they've even dictated the increase in out-of-state fees because they consider the, the resources that Louisiana provides being, being for Louisiana students. Uh, we know that there are a lot of issues uh, and the, the increase has created a significant burden on, on students. I mean, I've you know, you know, met with students early, even this morning uh, that are trying to figure out how can they stay in school and, and still be able to, uh, to meet the obligation of out-of-state fees. Uh, so I understand your concern on that. Um, next question is why is it that financial aid is the most unorganized department on campus and why are they so rude to us? Um, I almost would defer that to, uh, to Mr. Clark, uh, but let me, you know, you know, there's not an easy answer to that. There's not a, you know, there's not a stock answer to that. Um, you know, I, I believe it's it's I believe they're good and and you know uh, good people in the financial aid office and there are some that get frustrated and and don't respond as well. Uh, we have to address it. You know, again, it goes back to to getting the feedback from you and getting feedback on the individuals themselves. Um, you know, we're you know we're still going to push. Uh, the idea of customer service push the idea of, of, of rewarding those that exhibit good customer service. Mr. Clark, do you have anything else you want to add? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is, when will the utilities be fixed permanently? If water is important for many reasons, it is not acceptable for a student who is paid for housing to continuously and randomly have to schedule a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hillary might be might be able to uh, to answer that. I think we made significant progress in terms of utilities. I mean, let me tell you about this campus. This campus is is saddled with an underground system that has been there for years and years and years and years. Um, it's the, the type of system, and Mr. Guillory can correct me at any time, you just jump in. And some of those pipes are what are called old terracotta pipes. In a lot of instances, those things deteriorate. They deteriorate over a large number of years. A lot of times you don't know it. They're underground, you don't realize what's happening until all of a sudden there's, there's water pressure on it, there's a leak. You go in, you fix that, the leak comes out somewhere else. 
Now we know, I know that there have been um, most recently a, a lot of work completed on some of the underground piping uh, to replace some. I'm not sure whether it was the chill or the hot water pipes on that. It was mainly the uh, hot water system. Uh, it was a hot water system that was put in uh, back in 1989 without, who am I, by sure hand, engineering majors? Okay, you may hear the term cathodic protection to keep metal from rusting. Well, to save money at the university, the state uh, decided to save $250,000, not put it in the cathodic protection to keep the pipes from rusting and have it pre insulated under the pipe. So that was removed, and back in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s, the pipe started rusting. And we started developing underground leaks, and we had to go back and request roughly five, six million dollars in order to replace that. So the new heating system that you have in three thirds of the uh, three fourths of the campus is your new heating system. The uh, this existing system is going back to the dormitory area, and we do have leaks in that area in that system uh, with the underground pipes. But uh, we have pipes that were installed back in the 1940s, which is for our sanitary uh, uh, station uh, system. And it's terracotta lines, and those lines are deteriorating as well. So you're looking at um, multiple of uh, 20 to $50 million in order to uh, correct our underground uh, sanitary sewer lines and our water lines throughout the campus. We have uh, electrical underground lines as well. Underground duct banks is going taking electrical power to the various buildings and to your transformers and to the switch gear in the buildings. And those switch gears are age and they can go out any moment now. But uh, that's one of the problems that we address as we put in capital outlay request for funding in order for uh, those funds to become available, we may go through some emergency uh, board to request funding, but usually it may take five to 10 years for the funds to become available. Um, I know when I was a student, I graduated in 82, and some of the same things that I observed when I was a student <coughs> still exist, but with preventative maintenance and deferred maintenance, we are taking care of some of those items, but it's a large, cost factor in order to uh, correct all those uh, underground infrastructure issues. Thank you. The, the second part of that question is, uh, is, is addressed to me. It says, where do you see the campus in five years? Uh, excellent question. It's, first of all, I see a lot of things that, that are here gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, another question that's coming up and, and we'll address it. Uh, the question was, how, when will the uh, dormitories be demolished, the old dormitories, and I know you're trying to be demolished, and what, what's the schedule on that? And I think those should be done within maybe a month or two uh, at the most? Um, I would say at least uh, three months. Three months. Uh, they, you know, they, I think they've gotten most of the, the intensive part done in terms of the asbestos <coughs> mitigation. That is correct. And the next step, of course, is to actually tear down. Uh, Dr. Dumas can address uh, I guess some some ideas in terms of how that that piece of property is going to be used, but I believe we uh, we have plans on initially using that as green space for additional exercise and uh, maybe even intramural fields or so, uh, and you know tracks uh, so that there are things that we can do in that to make it accessible to you for uh, for use and long range maybe to expand the rec center. Of course, if we we're able to do that. Uh, in terms of swimming pool. swimming pool, so those are the so the ideas that that are planned on it. We have a lot of buildings on this campus that are vacant. Uh, that that we have to decide whether we have the resources to either either renovate them for usage or to tear them down. A lot of those on this part of the campus. The other thing that that we are sorely lacking is in terms of monies for not only maintenance but renovation and and the incorporation of technology into all of the classrooms. Uh, so what I see in, in, in five years for this university is 
either through funds gained through the legislature or eventually going into a capital campaign fund with the, uh, with the support of the system in coming in and be able, being able to go in and address classroom space, uh, being able to address renovation of the classrooms, being able to bring technology into classrooms, uh, see us moving more into a, a technology-based uh, university uh, so that you know students will be able to come in and and whether it's you know ideally I'd like to see us get into to the technology being used for all the all the classes and 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 whether it's iPads or some type of tablets or some type of electronic equipment that we begin to make better use of but it has to be an environment a technological environment on the campus that supports that uh, so that's you know that's kind of where we go in terms of of that we like to add some additional uh, facilities in terms of athletics. We know that the um, volleyball team needs needs a place. We know that soccer, um, not you know, not volleyball, but soccer needs a place to play. Uh, we need to improve some of those facilities for our women's sports. So there are a number of things that we're doing. Uh, just just to throw something out as as an aside to part of what a lot of people consider the campus is Harding Boulevard and the property on the opposite side of the campus from us, uh, you know, that's an area that we're, that we, we're not neglecting in terms of, of the aesthetics of the campus also. Uh, there are three or four sites on that side that, that, that we believe that we can do something about. Uh, we're waiting on some, some private uh, investment dollars. You know, I've been told that the Villa Apartments, uh, that there's a possibility of a purchase on that being finalized soon in the renovation of the Villa Apartments, that we eliminate that eyesore once you come on campus. Um, I, had a, I had a visit this afternoon from a gentleman who, uh, who owned the, that little strip right next to the Kappa House uh, with the, all the old uh, front end loaders and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, so we knew that there was an issue with the property and, and who owned that. I passed by on my way back from a, from a uh, talk I had to give this afternoon and saw something being cleaned up over there and I said, oh, maybe, you know, maybe something is happening. I walked into my office and, and a gentleman I've known for a long time who owns part of that property was in there to tell me that he had just gotten an eviction notice for the person that was, that was occupying his part of that property. So it's being cleaned up by court order and that's being done. The gentleman still owns the other part of it, so we are working with the city to get that part cleaned up. It's, you know, it's still, even though it's not on campus, we, we consider it as a part of the campus. Uh, so there are a number of things that we, we like to do. Uh, the, um, the property with the Alumni Association owns right by the Red Stick Sculpture, uh, working with the Alumni Association to see what we can do in, in terms of, of that area. What you will see soon on the vacant property by the ROTC buildings, uh, that parking lot now that's used by the by the law school, uh, there's going to be an it's what do we call it, Mr. President? Is an is it an information center? It's going to it's Eli. It'll be a cultural center. Cultural center that's going up right on the river. Uh, I think we're probably missing still just a few hundred thousand dollars in funding for that. The plans have been drawn. Uh, most of the next to the, the next to the Museum of Art uh, that will house a cultural center with meeting space, with with lecture room space, with reception space, uh, designed to eventually have a pavilion overlooking the river. So those are you know those are things that are on the drawing boards. It's been discussion. We know that parking is a problem. Uh, you know, there have been discussion for a number of years about a, a, a parking facility on campus that, that becomes quite expensive and it's, it's been a question of whether we can generate enough revenue to retire the bonds necessary to build a parking lot. Okay? Where would you build it and where would it be most convenient? So those are the things that we, when I say where do we see the campus in five years physically, there are a lot of things that are going on, a lot of plans. We have a master plan for the campus. I think it should be a fluid plan uh, that, uh, that we're able to identify with priorities on those projects that we want to, to get accomplished. Next question, I'm getting close to my end, I think. Uh, how do you plan on fixing the slope failure 
of the open channel ravine embankment between Jesse Stone and Helen Barone Avenue. Ms. Gillard. Uh, we've been working. Does everybody know what we're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> uh, where the NAR checkpoint is. Uh, we've been working with uh, the Corps of Engineers and we are building a box cover. Uh, we, that's, that's roughly uh, 10 by 10 by 150 linear feet. And then we're going to come back and backfill that portion of it. Uh, the next phase is to obtain funding in order to build the new road of the, where the um, pipe coffin is. It's a metal coffin and it's beginning to rust out and we're going to raise that portion of the road uh, to be above the flood stage of the Mississippi River, which uh, is when it comes up around elevation 35 feet above sea, sea level. Uh, that's when we start having problems with the water coming across the road. And as it recedes, then the deterioration starts taking place with uh, the soil. So uh, it is in the, in the plans. Uh, one of the questions that come up about the roads, well, in that area there, we know we have problems with potholes. Uh, we have <clears throat> underground soil-based conditions that is, that's real poor. And because of all the construction that had taken place since the early 90s, we built uh, the dormitories, the apartments, and once we finish completing the demolition of the existing apartments, then we are planning to uh, rework the new roads that's the existing roads that are coming back there. So that's a part of the master plan uh, from, from that standpoint. Let me add one other thing. We were talking about the ravine, and uh, when we talk about plans, future plans for the university, about a year ago, I met with the uh, urban forestry department and when we started looking at looking at the ravine and the condition that, we, that it was in uh, you know how do we clean it up how do we you know how do we make that an integral part of the campus when you consider it it's really a, a could be a beautiful addition to the campus if it's if it's done correctly well we we approached the urban forestry department they went and looked at it and realized that there were a lot of of uh, trees and vegetation native to Louisiana all through that ravine and that it offered an opportunity for what we call a, a urban forest uh, education laboratory. We went to DC met with the uh, director of the US Forest Service and they, they've been strong partners with us in, in the urban forestry department. They then funded a $60,000 study. They agreed on it. They actually came in. We had a a visit with them. They came and reviewed the whole area. Uh, they looked at it and felt that it, it provided an opportunity for what they again called an urban forestry learning service, a learning lab, outdoor learning lab. Uh, so they funded the study. Uh, that study has been completed. Uh, it was presented to me a few weeks ago by uh, Dr. Abdullahi of the Urban Forestry Department. Uh, it's identified the native trees in that area. It's also developed a plan to go in, clean up that area, uh, retain the, the trees that are critical and do a walking path, uh, you know, have it so that it's, it's usable. Uh, so students, whether it's, whether it's our urban forestry students, whether it's high school students from, from around the city or the state coming in interested in urban forestry and what it can do. Uh, but the U.S. Forest Service has also indicated a willingness to eventually support us in terms of providing the funds necessary to go in and do that. That's pretty long. Uh, ravine. It's it's a lot of it's just visible uh, right against the you know the walkway coming up behind the, the law school. Uh, but of course, you know it goes all the way back, and it 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 really is a natural drainage for the city of Baton Rouge uh, into the Mississippi River. So there are things we have to do with the Corps of Engineers, um, but we believe that there's an opportunity for that to again be part of of the beautification of the Southern University campus. Um, like I said, the, the Forest Service is committed to the project. Uh, they're, you know, they, they've asked us to do the study. We've done that. We've completed it. We've presented to them uh, that step. So the next step is go out and seek the phase one funding to start, start looking at, at clearing up that area as a beautification project. Last one I have is, is it possible to get scholarship dollars to fund or help fund the education for legacy students? You know, legacy students are those students whose parents are graduated from 
uh, Southern University. And, uh, right now, the, the assistance available for legacy students is a partial waiver of the out-of-state fees. It's a 50% waiver of the out-of-state fees if your parent graduated, if your parent is not a resident of Louisiana but graduated from Southern University. Um, scholarship dollars, we are we're constantly uh, in search of scholarship dollars. I know that SGA has done its part in terms of, of funding using some of your fees and through the uh, Office of Student Affairs offering scholarships to Southern University students. Uh, we have made an effort on the, at the chances level to increase the amount of scholarship dollars uh, that we have available on a need basis. Uh, most of you are aware that we have a, you know, 2014 is our centennial year. Uh, part of that, that drive is a chancellor's need based scholarship fund that we are pushing and, and beginning probably in the next two weeks you'll see a, a much, much harder uh, push for monies from alumni, from sponsors, from corporate sponsors, so that we can develop a, a really strong scholarship fund for students, not just legacy students, but all students here at Southern University. I mean, all of you know it, and, and most of you, or some of you probably have been up to our office and, and have, have filled out the scholarship applications. And then a lot of times we can't do everything that we that we would like to do because of the the lack of a, a large source of dollars. The Alumni Association helps, the Foundation helps, President Mason has 1880 Society uh, that's available. So we're trying to identify, identify all the resources that we have. But we want to make a big, strong effort during this year to, to create a really strong scholarship fund to help, to, uh, help Southern University students. Uh, we probably have a little over $100,000 uh, that have been contributed. Uh, to that fund right now, and and we're pushing the letters out to uh, to contacts and and Miss Bray and and uh, Miss Bobby is part of that committee working with us uh, from the student aspect. Uh, but we know that we're we're going to make a really strong effort to increase the scholarship dollars available for you uh, for this coming academic year and future academic years. I think that's mine. Any. Elaboration. Thank you. Um, I think we have a few remarks from President Mason. Okay, good. How's everybody this evening? Um, so I was listening to the questions you asked the Chancellor, and I think that uh, I can offer a little, little insight from where I sit. You know, I'm president of the system, and Southern is the only historically black university system in America. And the flagship campus is here in Baton Rouge, but we also have the community college in Shreveport, we have the four-year school in New Orleans, and we have uh, the law school and the Ag Center here. Now, the world is changing for us. Uh, you heard the chancellor talk about our uh, financial issues. That's a national thing. Uh, states are getting out of the higher education business and they're making students and parents pay more and more and more uh, the cost of education, which means that we have to be much more customer sensitive uh, because we have to go out and compete for students. Uh, we don't just compete now against historically black universities, we compete against UL Lafayette and UL Hammond. So we really do have to bring our A game, A game to the table. Uh, to be honest with you, we haven't had our A-game here for a minute uh, for a lot of different reasons. Some is the budget cuts. You know, some of it is, is really what I call the cumulative effect of politics over time. Uh, we saw they have three kinds of people in the system. We have people that know what they're doing and work hard. We have people that uh, don't know what they're doing but are willing to learn and work hard. And then we have people that don't give a damn. And we're trying to make sure we find the people that don't give a damn and get rid of them so we can get some better people in here. Now, the, um, the bigger picture is this. We're trying to build a new Southern on the traditions of the past. Now, we know that in order to deal with your customer service issues, we don't have enough money on every campus to provide the quality of service that you need in certain areas. For example, uh, your, your information technology, right? Your computer systems. We have uh, decent ones in all, on all five of the campuses, but we need one really, really good one in a technology age. 
So what we're doing is we're combining all of the ones from across the campuses and putting together one good one that'll serve all of the campuses. And that's what this trend, you've heard about transformation. That's what that transformation is. We're trying to find ways to do what we do better with the money that we have to work with. So you're gonna see a centralized information technology department, a centralized human resources department, centralized accounting department, centralized, uh, missing something else in there. But the point is this, it's all the stuff you shouldn't see or worry about or have to try to argue about whether you're getting the services or not, because if they're doing their job, you don't notice it. But you notice it every day because if I ask you whether you love Southern but hate what it does to you, you probably say yes. And I hear that from alumni all the time, but that's because we got to pick up our game and bring it a hate game. So my job is to help the chancellors on all the campuses uh, look good, get better, and we're going to give them the support they need to get that done. Okay? Does all that make sense? Yes. Good. So our goal is this, to make a little progress every day. Um, and, and, and I think we're doing that. You know, we're seeing the IT get a little better every day. We had clean audits for the first time in six or seven years. And that's a little better every day. You've seen those dormitories come down. They sat there for about, what, a decade or something? Longer than that, a triangle. Oh, but they're coming down now. You know, uh, five years ago, if you said, when are they coming down, nobody would have known. Now we can tell you within three to six months. So you're going to see a little progress every day so that the value of your degree will be a little more valuable every day, because that's really what it's all about. When you walk out there with that Southern degree, what do people think it's worth? Hmm. And we're going to make sure that when you walk out of that door, tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, it'll be worth a little more and a little more and a little more, okay? If y'all, do y'all have other questions for me? Because I can stay, you know, do you? No, oh, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> now look, we got to vote on this transformation stuff. I told you, President here, uh, if y'all don't understand it and you don't know what it is, have me come to talk about it because we need her to support it, okay? It's all about building a better Southern and, and, and the value of that degree. And she's a vote on that board, so y'all need to tell her, you know, that this is something that's good for Southern, all right? She worked for y'all just like I do. <laughs> okay, good. Any other questions? Anything before I go? All right. God bless the Jaguar Nation. Okay, now, my name is Kevin Johnson. I'm the Deputy Administrator for the University Police Department. I have, have all the administrative issues and other criminal issues. And the questions I have here are several. And I'll start with this one here. Why does it cost $2 to make a police report? Well, actually, to make a report doesn't cost anything, but to get a copy of that report does cost $2, which, by the way, is the lowest cost in East Baton Rouge, Paris. Most uh, agencies charge $10, and some of them charge a dollar page, and so on. So to answer that question again, to make a police report does not cost anything, but to get a copy of it, it does. It costs $2. Uh, it says here, uh, are we working on better parking for students? Uh, if you've been here for a couple of years or so, you've seen the Activity Center uh, project, which uh, there was another question here about parking. Where does the money for tickets go? And that's one of the uh, China examples there where we spent several hundred thousand dollars on that project, and that's where that money came from. Uh, we also have several other projects slated. One of them is to look at the uh, parking by the stadium and also to restrike the, uh, the campus, the center lines, the curves, and the other parking areas. So that's, that's one of the things that we're doing. Uh, there's another question here about are we going to increase the number of spaces. Right now, if we look at the activity center, uh, on any given day, you'll see two or 300 of these parking spaces. And back in the dorm areas, there's, uh, there's adequate parking there. In the last couple of years, we've increased the number of spaces by adding on the uh, parking lot right next to the nursing school, which was a, uh, a faculty lot that is now a student lot in that area. So we are doing some things to uh, improve the parking on the campus. Uh, let's see. Okay, it says, uh, why is it that students cannot park at the student union until after hours? Uh, the union is one of the centers on the campus. You've got deliveries coming in from the post office. A lot of those spaces over there are designed for the uh, employees. That's right in the center of the part of the campus where you have the uh, uh, union employees, uh, student affairs, um, academics, uh, registrars, 
You also have uh, parents that come in with their children, prospective students to come in and, and get their documentation to, to join school. So that's why those spaces there are reserved for those items rather than in a parking area. But it is correct, after five o'clock it is open for uh, parking. Okay, is it possible that athletes can get access to park near the facilities or practice field during parking during practice hours? That's correct. If your if your car is registered, even if you stay in the dorms and have a dorm sticker, if you park in the activity center parking lot for practice, or if you start by the by the stadium, those areas there, you can't park in those areas if you're there for practice. So we talked with uh, some of the athletes a couple of years ago and put that in place. Uh, why is the strip blocked off? Uh, the night before a football game is extreme inconvenience to residents. Let me ask this question. Are we talking about this, the strip, the main street, E.C. Harrison, or are we talking about by Reed and White? E.C. Harrison. E.C. Harrison, okay. That area before a football game is we have the Jaguar fans come in the night before and to set up for tailgatings. And what they do is they block off that area and keep it clear to a certain time to let those people come in, drop off their, uh, their tailgating uh, equipment, and to move their vehicles. Otherwise, it'll just get totally uh, blocked up in that area. Uh, a couple of years, well, about a year or so ago, uh, they embarked upon a new parking plan for football, and that was one of the areas that they looked at. They, they resolved these areas, looked at them, and uh, made that plan to keep those people out of those areas for a certain time so that those tailgates can come in. Because believe it or not, people come in 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon before a football game. And this year, we really had even more fans, so it really got crowded in there. That is my last question. Are there any other parking questions? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, when students park, I mean, when student athletes park at the field house, they do still give us. Yeah, they, they cannot park at the field house itself. That's a reserved parking area. But they can park right next to it in the big parking lot by the stadium. They can park there. Or if you're doing practice at the activity center, they can park there also. But the area right in front of the right in front of the uh, field house is reserved. It's mostly for the coaches and the other uh, employees that work there. Okay. Uh, if, if I can just take one quick minute, um, information an information item. Um, if you will go to the uh, SUBR website and click on uh, University Police, I encourage everybody to sign up for First Call. First Call is the university's emergency notification system. Uh, we've all read the newspapers about uh, incidents that are taking place on college campuses. Heaven forbid that happens here. But if you go there, it doesn't cost anything. You sign up. It walks you through the, uh, the uh, sign-up uh, procedure. And uh, if you get some kind of message, something happens, we will send you out a text message, an email, uh, and also a phone call to let you know what's going on at that time. So I encourage you, please, to sign up for first call. Go to subr.edu. Go to the police department uh, website, click on it, and you'll see there on the left-hand side the uh, procedures for signing up for that. Thank you. So that's 14 meals a week. 
and you have to rotate all those items, they're going to repeat themselves. So we try to prepare them in different ways so that they won't be prepared the same way all the time. The menu rotates on four, four weeks at a time. So um, there are four different menus that we have and they do rotate. Uh, we have heard from students that have taken our surveys that yes, you would like to see something different. So uh, this coming uh, summer, and we're, we're going to do some planning where we recognize our students would like to see things that they're accustomed to seeing here in the South. So we have heard you, we understand your comments, and we want your suggestions. I have a uh, meeting that I do once a month in Mayberry where it's uh, nine with the director and it's open to all students to come and attend, and um, I'm always begging people to come. I'm pulling people uh, from the dining halls to come and sit down and talk to me about things that they would like to see on the menu, things that they would like to see change, um, critique what we're doing, ask us questions, and usually five students show up. So we want your input. It helps us to help you and to provide meals that you would like to see. There also was a question about flies. Um, our oldest dining hall is done, which is about 40 years old, and there is some structural problems there, and it's mainly with our plumbing. And so we have a lot of leaks that are done, mm. and we have water in areas that is um, we're constantly trying to repair and, um, and make the changes necessary, working with the physical plant, and uh, Dr. Dewis is assisting to get those things taken care of. We have plans to correct those problems. Also, the question comes up, why you know that um, we limit the amount of service you get when you go to the line? Um, every serving that we give you in your protein is a fourth of a pound of meat. So if you get two pieces of chicken, that's a fourth, fourth of a chicken. You get four, you get a half of a chicken. So think about what your serving sizes are. And we allow you to come back as many times as you like. If you like to eat a whole chicken, we're okay with it. <laughs> if you like to eat a pound of beef, we're okay with that. But be mindful that the people behind you are in line as well to get you one serving. Once you finish eating that, come back and get more. We know every student that comes in our dining hall at one meal, at lunch or dinner, eats five plates of food. Five plates. And so a fourth of a piece of meat is on every one of those plates. So at lunch and dinner, you're eating a pound of meat at every meal. Any questions?
the other item, um, I have several uh, pertaining to campus lighting. We have uh, started a phase two campus lighting for the campus. Uh, we put in new LED campus lights on some of the roadways and interior wise. We realize that we have to show some improvements on the wattage for the LED lights. Uh, we are constantly surveying the areas at night. Some of the older buildings that has incandescent lights or metal halide or high pressure sodium lights, we are planning to uh, have those lamps replaced with new. It's uh, time consuming, but uh, but we are getting there and identifying there. If there are certain areas that you would like to see additional lights there, you know, just let us know. Uh, go through your SGA, and your SGA knows how to contact uh, my department. Uh, you'll notice that we have a couple of, uh, probably about eight different 100-foot uh, tower lights that, uh, that we put up, and we will have those working uh, hopefully within the next uh, month or so, uh, fully illuminated accordingly. So uh, in terms of lighting issues, uh, just submit that to the SGA and we will uh, address those. for medical assistance. Uh, to answer that question, earlier this year, there was a federal mandate that changed or adjusted the types or amounts of health insurance that universities were required if they elected, if they elected to offer health insurance to their students. There was a certain degree of coverage that had to be offered. Um, we advertised, there was an RFP put out uh, Vice Chancellor McClinton, Dr. Lorenz, and myself worked together with the Systems Administration to obtain some uh, quotes and some prices to see if it was a feasible option to continue because historically you all have had the student health insurance, I think there was a $15,000 annual limit that in, uh, included an accidental death benefit. That was about $162 per year if my memory serves me correct. Um, and Dr. Lorenz, you can chime in if I'm incorrect. I think the least expensive bid that we got would have been to maintain the coverage, the minimum amount of coverage required would have been about $1,100 a semester in addition to your current tuition and fees. So instead of putting that on top of the steadily increasing cost of attendance with tuition, fees, housing, and all the other things that go along with that, we elected to expand the services that are currently, were currently made available at the uh, Student Health Center. The hours were extended. Uh, you can now go to the Student Health Center on nights and weekends. Some of the services that were initially uh, included under the health coverage, such as lab work, uh, certain x-rays, we have uh, memorandums of understanding with into, uh, healthcare agencies here in Baton Rouge who offer those services. So we, uh, and we increased the health coverage costs. The student that thought that was more logical, uh, it was something that, that pained us greatly to do it because historically uh, students have relied heavily on the health insurance uh, and often cases that was, that was the only health insurance that was available. Um, but in the best interest of you all and the overall institution in terms of enrollment and your needs, we went ahead and uh, passed on the, on the opportunity to offer that insurance because of the cost that would have been associated. So no, you do not have health insurance, but the services offered by the infirmary of the Student Health Center have been, expa have been expanded significantly to try to accommodate you and your needs here on campus. Next question. Uh, and this may have been a question for Dr. Lorenz, but it says, are there any future plans in terms of getting another live mascot? If so, what is the approximate time frame that this will commence? I think I'm correct when I say that there are currently no plans or intentions uh, to replace Lacumba, who was our last uh, living mascot. The requirements, I'm sure, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Mike the Tiger's Habitat, uh, but it's a multi-million dollar facility and there are certain rules and guidelines uh, 
that are expected from institutions or entities that house these animals that you have to have uh, suitable facilities in order to, to house them and maintain them. And our primary concern at this time is to ensure that your academic and your residential facilities that our students live in are second to none before we begin investing in uh, an animal habitat. Next question, uh, kind of a statement. I appreciate student affairs involving students in the hiring process of the associate vice chancellor, which is in the final stages, by the way. However, what are other ways that student affairs will incorporate students in administrative decisions? Uh, it's kind of an open question, not exactly certain what specifically um, was meant, but I mean, student affairs is what it is. Um, since I have been here, my team and the, the team in student affairs have tried to ensure that students felt a part of everything that was going on uh, to cater everything that we do uh, towards your, your wants and needs and your desires to ensure that you have a satisfactory uh, matriculation here at Southern University as it relates to student life. Um, there is no decision that we make. Of course, there will be administrative decisions that don't you always don't agree with, but when appropriate or as most as, as much as humanly possible, we will uh, consult you all before we make decisions that affect you. I couldn't understand that one. And this last one says, why are meal plans mandatory for students that live on campus? Why can't it be optional? Um, and Ms. Brown, feel free to chime in if you like. Recently, we just went through a system-wide uh, effort, uh, economies of scale. You heard President Mason talking about transformation, where the food service contract was bidded out, awarded to Aramark again. That's just uh, the nature of, of the way it goes in higher education. Typically, when, we, when these vendors present us with proposals and say that we can offer you this service for X amount of dollars, they, in advance of making a proposal to us, they always ask us, how many students do you have living on your campuses? Uh, how many students do you have that uh, participate in commuter meal plans? What's your overall student enrollment? And the prices that they give us are based on the information that we provide them with. So it would be unfair uh, to a vendor to tell them that we have approximately 1,800 students living on campus and make the food service uh, enrollment in the meal plan optional and only 200 people take advantage of it. Uh, that puts us, puts the company at a disadvantage and uh, limits what they will be able to avail, to make available to those students who participate in it. So it's, it's kind of, um, I guess, understood when you enter into these types of agreements that they have an expectation of the university in terms of us being able to provide to them a certain number of students uh, to fund their operations and what they're expected to do. Um, and there are instances, which are not many, uh, for medical exceptions that are reviewed by our student health center. If there is for, if there is any reason that the campus dining department cannot meet your needs, uh, if there's a certain diet or uh, dietary restraints or, or any, any particular reason that's medically related, then you can't apply a request uh, permission to be exempted from the meal plan. But aside from that, all students that reside on campus and residential facilities uh, have been and will be expected to participate in the meal plan. And those are my questions, thanks. Good evening again. First question, what will be done is what will be done as far as maintenance workers not responding in a reasonable time manner? Um, Dr. Lorenz earlier stated um, that the university has been faced with budget cuts over the past several years, and that has impacted um, the staff on campus and some of the maintenance workers in the residential area, of course, were laid off, and we're in the process of now replacing those repairmen to uh, address the issues. But of course. You have to go through the civil service process and it's not a very competitive base and it's hard to find good employees to replace or fill those positions uh, with the pay grade that they're offered. So we are in the process of hiring uh, more maintenance personnel to fill those positions to address uh, 
the issues um, with responding in a reasonable time. Second question is, in the university departments, what could be done to be assurance that the laundry rooms are consistently clean? Um, and I'm gonna address that uh, campus-wide. Um, the students live in the residence facilities and it's just like when you live at home, you keep your facilities clean where you live. So it's pretty much, we have staff on campus um, that work Monday through Friday from 8 to 5, and we have made adjustments to the, the uh, custodial staff to help keep the residential facilities clean throughout the week. Um, but over the several, I guess since the students have returned, I've noticed in the evenings that the students place trash in front of the buildings. Um, they place trash, large trash bags, in a small trash can. If the trash bin is full or small trash can outside of the building, they place a trash bag next to the trash can. Um, Mr. Eli, Mr. Hillary spoke that they are, they have uh, large bins outside of every residential facility. And those trash bins are for your large trash bags that are in your dormitories. It's not for you to place your large trash bags in the small trash cans. So you have to take pride in where you live to make sure that the residential facilities are clean. If there's something that we can do to assist to keep those facilities clean that you think we're not doing, my door is always open. I'm in the university departments. My office is always open. I see several students that have come in to see me and talk to me about various issues. Um, I see several of my RAs are here tonight. Um, so we always strive to keep the facilities to the best that we can for you all to live in. And the uh, last question I really don't understand why are residential assistants most harassing? Hmm? <laughs> don't understand that question, but they're charged with a job. And um, they have a schedule that they abide by and rules that they have to perform and they have a, a guideline that they have to live up to. So uh, how many RAs are here tonight? Please stand up. Stand up. Form RAs. So these are students that are here to help you. They live with you, among you. So they are not here to harass you. They are here to make sure that you all abide by the living facilities, rules and regulations. So that so you know they're not being harassed and they're just doing their job. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ms. Abraham indicated is that we uh, just poured concrete for a new uh, parking uh, lot next to the uh, conference. And it happened over the weekend, but uh, students have just taken upon themselves to figure that they can go ahead and start writing graffiti into the uh, concrete when we had barricaded it off. So it's all about taking pride in uh, this campus. Good evening. Good evening. My first question is, could financial aid make an effort to inform students of their status, especially if verification is the issue? Uh, y yes, we can. Uh, initially, our our communications are going through your SUBR email accounts, which I know many students are not using to its maximum uh, capacity. Uh, we would like students to understand that your SUBR email account is your official email account, and correspondence that come from the financial aid office will be directed to that email account uh, first. The other thing is that we want students to refer to Banner Self Service in order to identify the items that our office needs. We understand that many times students go to their Banner Self Service account, but primarily <coughs> just to check on classes. That portal also provides you with real-time information as it pertains to the financial aid office. So we urge you to check your SUBR email account and to log on to Banner Self Service under the financial aid tab for updated information. 
Another question is, why does financial aid take so long? <coughs> the reality is everybody's financial aid uh, process isn't the same. Every, most students have different circumstances and that requires additional information from our office in order to determine your eligibility. Historically, the challenge that the financial aid office has experienced is that many of our students are very creative when it comes to their financial aid process. Once you exercise some of this creativity, we are then forced to verify the information that you've provided uh, to us. The verification process is not determined by the financial aid office. Verification process is not determined by the financial aid office. That is determined by the Department of Education. They select a number of applicants based on the school code that they believe that the school should verify that the information is accurate. As I mentioned before, the creativity. If it is for some reason you enter something that creates a disparity from what you submitted the year before and the Department of Education believes that the school should take another look it will be categorized as conflicting information and we would then have to request the information from you. So in all cases, it's not a 100% verification process, but we also still need to get that information in order to determine your eligibility. So if you submit the information timely, you submit what is requested of you, and it's consistent with what was on your application, I can guarantee you that your financial aid process will be completed timely. If it is you want to exercise some creativity, or you are tardy in submitting the information to us, yes, that does prolong your, your process. So please understand that everybody's situation is, is different and we take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we would like to see everyone's financial aid uh, process as quickly as possible, because believe me, I don't want to be in alliance with you either. Um, the other thing, the other question is, how can communication skills between the financial aid office and students be improved? As I mentioned before, uh, the email is our primary uh, form of communication. However, I do urge all students to not only identify who your financial aid counselor is, but to make an appointment and sit down and speak to that person. I think if you're more familiar with the process and you're more comfortable uh, sharing what your particular situation is with your counselor, you can pretty much get all your questions answered and we can complete your process in a timely manner. The last question I have is, why are the book awards not gonna be issued every semester? Uh, this is not a true statement. The book awards are offered every semester, provided you have excess funds available in your account, we can issue the book voucher that you can remit at the bookstore. Thank you. have a comment um, about what you said about the, whoever asked the question about the emails. I know that I get an email from like every day. Even, look at that, God. Every day, they call my mom's house every day, just remind me to get my registration done. My mom would call me and told me to do whatever I had to do because she was tired of them calling her. So I think they've done a great job in getting that, that accomplished. I have uh, one question here. Uh, and, uh, Wilbur, sorry, Director of Athletics. Uh, I've got one question here. The question is, how can we as a university get students uh, involved in supporting all sports, uh, particularly women's sports? And uh, to speak generally, uh, there's, a, there's a responsibility that we have as an athletic department, uh, including uh, administrators, student, student athletes, and coaches. Um, and there's a responsibility that students have uh, in terms of being involved, and, and I'll just kind of go through those generally and uh, try to offer what I, what I, I guess is a, a best guess at how we can get those things done. So we have to, uh, our student athletes and our coaches have to reach out uh, to the student body, to the community. So, you know, if we've got games coming up, particularly for women's sports, um, we encourage uh, uh, the coaches and the coaches that encourage the student athletes for them to go out when, when they're in their classrooms, when they're um, in their circles of friends, when they're in the residence halls, uh, to let people know that there are games coming up to encourage them to attend. Uh, so that's part of our responsibility. 
uh, schedule, uh, making sure that we highlight our most uh, important and exciting matchups um, uh, that, that will have that kind of an interest. Uh, athletic success, so making sure that we field uh, competitive teams, teams that are, that are uh, winning more than they lose and competing for championships. And uh, we've certainly had success uh, almost across the board in the last couple of years in that, in that particular area. Uh, promotion, uh, putting up posters, having give giveaways uh, for students, uh, um, engaging on social media, and we've done a lot more in those areas in the past couple of years. And uh, budget permitting, as we as we are able to continue increasing revenues, uh, we hope to do more in that area. Uh, and then event management, uh, finding ways to involve students at the actual events. Uh, so providing you with good seats, uh, providing you uh, 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 opportunities to participate in contests, win, win prizes and awards would be recognized. Um, and we're open to that. We've, we've done a lot more in that regard, and uh, we, we want to do more as well. Um, as far as students' responsibility, uh, students have responsibility to be engaged. So uh, as students, and, and you being here tonight is a testament to that. You know what's going on on campus. You're taking advantage of those opportunities. And athletics, we just try to provide uh, entertainment and opportunity for you to express your pride uh, uh, in, in Southern University. So there's a responsibility for students uh, to be engaged, to know when events are, uh, and to, to attend those events, and to be excited, to cheer loudly, et cetera. Uh, there, you have a responsibility to ask for what you want. Uh, I do my best to engage uh, with students, alumni, fans, and supporters on, on social media uh, in my daily interactions. Uh, I try to be present on campus and not just remain holding my office all day. Um, but I, I get a lot of requests uh, from students, and, and students, alumni, etc. And believe it or not, uh, some of those re requests do get met. Uh, we can't meet all of them, obviously. If you come up to me and ask, if you can start at point guard in the game on Saturday, chances are Coach Banks isn't gonna allow you to do that. Uh, but if it's a reasonable request, if we have the budget to accommodate it, or we have the means to meet that request, um, and it's something that we think is going to get students excited, we're interested in doing it. Um, and finally, there's a responsibility that students have to share your experience with friends. If you've attended a game, you had a good time, won a prize, you got called down onto the field or onto the court, um, and, and you had a nice experience, go and tell someone about it. Uh, if you have a roommate that doesn't typically attend events, if you uh, have classmates uh, that you know don't attend events, bring them along. Um, they might have a good time as well. They might share that share that experience as well with others. So um, we have a, a an uh, excuse me a responsibility in common uh, to increase attendance at events. But I will say that I'm I'm actually quite pleased uh, with attendance here. We've set attendance records in in, uh, in volleyball and in soccer in the past couple of years. Football attendance is strong. Basketball attendance has improved uh, considerably, and a lot of that has to do with uh, students. We had several football games this year where we were looking for places to put you guys. You know, uh, after you filled up the student section, which was roughly 3,500 seats. So, so I, I'm pleased with student uh, turnout. You can always improve, um, and if there's anything that we can ever do that you think is an idea worth us exploring, we're open to the idea. Questions. I also got a question and it asks, what are the long-term benefits that SGA offers? And I can tell you that um, in a recent study it said that colleges didn't get students ready for, as it pertains to interdisciplinary skills, as far as talking to other people and being relatable. And I believe SGA helps you with that. It helps you to work with a group of people that you may have never met or never thought it may have no interest together. You all might have two different majors, but it shows you how you can work together with people from various spectrums. Um, also, it uh, gives you a lot of opportunities to meet a lot of people. I am I have very great relationships with everyone on this panel, and I know that in my future, if I never ever needed anything, I could call them and ask them for it, and they would be so ready to help me. At least I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now do we have any administrators who want to give brief remarks? Yeah, sure. I'll be brief. I know y'all want to get out of here. 
Um, <laughs> but I want to thank uh, Ms. Breck, our Student Government Association, for, for putting this together. I think it's a great idea. I was sitting there looking at it, you know, we have 6,000 students on this campus. Um, we have maybe 30, uh, which would be, what, less than 1% of the population turning out. And I, but I think it's critical. I think if you can get back and, and, and share with your, with your fellow students that the only way we can make this campus better is through communication. Okay? If we don't hear from you and you don't hear from us, then, then everybody's just going to buy their business complaining and nothing else gets done. Uh, so we have to hear from you, you have to be aware of what your needs are, what your concerns are, and go back and share that with your students. And one last thing, I, and, and we talked about federal aid, we talked about student loans. I have been we were reading a magazine this morning, Bloomberg Business Week, and they talked about the next big bubble, the next big financial bubble that's going to burst, that's going to create problems for this country. And that bubble is student loans. Um, I know that it's very difficult to finance your education. I know that it's, it's very attractive to, to try and go out and get as much money as you can uh, for that purpose, but I think uh, what I'd like to do is, is work with the SGA and, and student affairs and financial aid to give you, I think, maybe more awareness of exactly what you're facing when you graduate. Uh, uh, you know, look at it. This, you know, this article had a, a young lady who graduated with $170,000 in loans. Oh. Uh, couldn't afford to move out of her house. You know, was paying over $1,000 or two, three $3,000 a month in student loans. Student loans don't go away. Uh, um, you know, it's gonna be there with you, and that's what they're concerned about. It's, it's whether it's federal loans, whether it's subsidized loans, whether it's bank-backed loans. Uh, you know, think about it. We have to do a better job of preparing you. We have to do a better job of making sure that college is affordable, but we also have to do a better job of, of making you aware of, of what it does. And it's incumbent upon you, if you're gonna come in here and we know we have to rely on student loans, let's get out as quickly as possible, all right? Okay. The quicker you get out, the less you're low when you go out to go out and start earning money, the less, less of your money will be going towards paying back a loan that can go towards a car, an apartment, okay? clothes, you know, those kinds of things that, that you, you're here for, okay? So that, you know, I just want to throw that out. I think it's, it's something we have to do, and, and I'm open to, uh, you know, to some feedback on how we can do that and some things we can do in terms of financial literacy. The last thing I want to say is that I like this format, but I know there are a lot of things that are out there that you may not have brought up that you may have thought about. Please feel free to send me an email, okay? Um, shoot me a text, whatever you need. Share those things with me. Share, that, share your ideas with me. Share your concerns with me. And let's continue the dialogue, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Chancellor Lorraine. Anybody else? Okay, just want to again thank our administrative panel for coming out. It was, it's a great turnout, and you know they have very busy lives, children and spouses, and they all all have you know donated their time to us today. I just want to say thank you once again, and also thank you to the small but important part of student body that came out and is so aware and so conscious of what's going on at their university. So I hope you guys have a great night, and I'll see you at school tomorrow.